So who's my guest this week? Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Iwala, Harvard, MIT, ex-finance minister. So far, so predictable. But this head of the World Trade Organization is also breaking down barriers. The General Counsel agree to appoint Dr. Ngozi Konjo Uela of Nigeria as the next Director General of the WTO. The first woman, the first African, and wanting to inject morality in how we trade. She's fought corruption and put her own safety at risk by doing so. She's been named one of the most powerful women in the world four years running. The World Trade Organization, it made China. China made themselves, they did a good job, but they ripped off our country for years. But can she counter accusations that the WTO is in hock to China and embeds global inequality? I've got a feeling you're going to like this conversation. Here's a taste. The goal I have is to make everyone understand, including the members themselves sometimes when they forget, that we're here for people. And when you say people don't understand the WTO, do you think the WTO has to take some of the fault for that? Well, you're right. I agree with that. It is the fault that people don't understand really what it is and what it does. Has being a woman helped or hindered in your political life? <laughs> I think it's helped in the sense that I'm, I'm happy to be a woman, I'm proud of being a woman, I'm proud of being who I am. Dr Ngozi, thank you for joining me. You have just reached a year at the helm of the WTO. I believe you threatened to walk out last September, or you could do. You hadn't bought furniture in your place in Geneva yet. What, what changed? <laughs> I think that there was too much made of uh, what I was saying. I didn't threaten to walk out. I told members, indeed, I had not bought furniture, you know, to spur them on, you know, to try and uh, negotiate harder, work harder. For me, this is a job I'm really passionate about. So even when I make comments, it's all geared to getting more of the work done, getting results. Uh, if you're passionate about something and you feel that it's, you're there to deliver for people. So I'm impatient uh, for action, for results. Uh, that's what drives me. Yes, I, I suppose it was just if you felt that the, the WATO had done a better job at getting, uh, if you like, more respected by those it seems to have lost respect amongst not least America? Well, I, I don't uh, agree with the way you characterize it. It's amazing that even when you say the organization has lost respect uh, or is not supported, one way you can gauge that is whether members pay their dues. If you've lost respect for an organization and you no longer want to be part of it, you wouldn't support it, would you? But I'm very proud to say that, uh, including the United States, all our members are paying up uh, uh, their dues. Uh, they are very supportive. Yes, we do have some issues, um, that some challenges. Joe Biden has just said the US continues to have systematic concerns with the, the WTO. And at the heart of this, for those who aren't that familiar with it, you know, there's this concern about the requirement for American workers to compete against Chinese forced labor, but not stopping sometimes the, the theft of American intellectual property and products. It's, it's about how you have made the playing field unequal. That's one of the biggest criticisms that actually Trump, Obama and Biden have agreement on. I think there's a misnomer here. The WTO does not make the playing field unequal. The role is to level the playing field and to put rules in place that will ensure fair uh, trade for everybody. Now, have those rules been changed in the past 25 years? The answer is no. So obviously, some of the agreements uh, need to be brought up to date. Some of the rules have to be looked at and new rules have to be put in place. So th that is what is uh, the issue here. But to say that the WTO doesn't serve, I don't agree with that because 75% uh, of world trade still takes place. Uh, based on WTO rules. And in spite of the hot rhetoric you hear between countries, let's say US and China, trade between the two countries is still quite robust. 
No, but it's, I'm going off the, the signs from the leaders of those countries who actually have very different political views that they've all expressed frustration. And, and you yourself have just said those rules need updating. So what's the WTO been doing? What has the WTO been doing? The WTO has been maintaining that level playing field for most of the trade in the world. As I said, in spite of all the criticism, 75% of world trade still takes place on the basis of those rules. And if it didn't exist, like I said, when I was competing for this job, you'd have to invent it. So the key issue is, how do we make the reforms that are needed? Yes, that, that's, that is my question. That, that, sorry, that, that is at the heart. No, of absolutely. Um, to point out that there are challenges, there are reforms. I myself said that when I was uh, competing for this job. So we, we need to embark on those reforms. And indeed, we are uh, beginning to do that. Part of the reform is to complete a multilateral negotiations, which the organization has not done in a long time. And that's what we've been pushing for. We are nearer, closer than we've ever been to completing the fishery subsidies negotiations. Uh, and I think had it not be the fact that we postponed our, our um, um, uh, a ministerial meeting from last November due to Omicron, we could have been there by now. So we are regaining momentum, you know, to, to uh, try to complete that. We are also working on the response to the pandemic. The WTO is being responsive to a global issue of the global commons that is facing us, us now. We've been working very hard on several facets of this. We've been working on supply chain issues uh, with uh, vaccine manufacturers. This is where we have a monitoring and transparency function that can help producers look at what is happening to the supply chains. Uh, so th this is very important. You have huge, uh, you know, history and experience having been chair of Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, for a major moment for the WTO to perhaps improve uh, the view of it in the eyes of its critics. Where is the WTO going to come down on the side of patents with regards to vaccines uh, and intellectual property or lifting them for what's described as vaccine equity around the world? Because I'm unclear having read into this. Well, first of all, let me start by saying that vaccine inequity is plain wrong. And uh, we've, uh, I've been very clear on that as the Director General of the WTO. Inequity in access doesn't serve anybody, uh, even those who have been vaccinated, because, because it could lead uh, to more variants multiplying. Now, at the WTO, um, as I came in, I realized that several of the functions here could really be useful in helping the, the world to get to a more equitable situation with respect to vaccines. Like I said, people take it for granted, but the supply chains of vaccines are very complicated because they have so many components, up to 280 for some of the MNRA vaccines. If you have an export restriction or prohibition on one of those products, it means the vaccine cannot be produced. So simply getting our members to reduce the number of export restrictions and prohibitions, which were 119 at the start of the pandemic, and we are now down to 35, has helped to boost production in the world. Helping the producers monitor the bottlenecks in their supply chain, raw materials and so on, has helped them know what to do with them. That. So these kinds of functions are very important. Trade facilitation, we have a trade facilitation agreement designed to make goods move faster. And th this has been very helpful to the manufacturers. We are meeting with the CEOs of the vaccine manufacturers, the 10 of them, every few weeks to go over the issue. That's one side that is often overlooked because people focus on the IP and patents. But to make vaccines, you need a smooth supply chain. You need manufacturing capacity, which we've also been working with the manufacturers on. And then you need technology transfer and IP. On the IP side, there's been a, a, a negotiations, as you know, at the WTO. Uh, they were going on for almost a year before I came on the scene. And it's been very difficult because, of course, there are two po polarized sides. Proponents, more than 100 countries who want a waiver of the vaccine, seeing it as being of the uh, IP, intellectual property, seeing it as material to manufacturing vaccines. And those who believe that this could be a detriment 
to innovation and to research and development, the non-proponents. Now, what we've tried to do is to bridge the gap between the two. We are still working on it. We are not there yet, but we are inching forward. And, um, you, you know, we have a process going on now. How do you do that when you say it's two polarized sides like that? When you talk about bridging the gap, you're the director general. How, how do you go about doing that? And do you see an answer soon? Well, actually, the way things work here, members are supposed to talk to each other and try to bridge their gaps. But I've stepped into the process to try to help that along. And uh, it's well known, so I can say it, we're trying to work with four countries at the moment, the US, the EU, India, and, and South Africa, to see if we can come to a framework which we can then share with the rest of the membership fairly quickly. Uh, so we can uh, get to agreement on a text that everybody can support. It will be a compromise solution between the two sides. So by its nature, a compromise will not be satisfactory to all sides, but it is, there's what we call a landing zone. Uh, it will be a workable compromise, and that's what we are aiming for. What could that look like in the sense of, will it be that certain vaccines uh, that the, the patent is waived and others aren't? No, absolutely not. And I'm afraid, Emma, that this is one of the things I cannot do. We are in the middle of this negotiation. So uh, just talking to you about it puts it in jeopardy. So we have to be very sensible. Um, I cannot go into the details of what it could look like. When the agreement is made, we can talk about it. I've got to try and uh, get as much as I can, though, to, to understand, I suppose, from your perspective, how important is this particular landing zone to get right in terms of whether the WTO should exist at all? Because there are some who really don't think it is fit in its current state. Well, the WTO, I, I don't think we should uh, mix up all sorts of issues. I've already made it clear that the WTO is playing a role that people don't appreciate in the world, if it didn't exist, there would really be trouble in the multilateral trading system. That's not to say that the WTO does not have challenges and has to be made fit for purpose. Uh, but this, uh, this issue of the IP waiver, uh, there is a suitable compromise that would allow those who want access uh, um, to be able to uh, meet some of their needs whilst making sure that we don't disincentivize research and innovation, which is what the non-proponents want. So that's the kind of middle ground we're looking for. So nobody will have 100% of what they want, but there'll be a workable solution that both sides can live with. And the workable solution to, I don't know, a farmer in America who's lost his job because of uh, unfair competition with China, what's a workable solution that the WTO comes for him or her, if they're thinking, well, I'm not sure America should pay their dues to an organization that has still failed to reform trading practices between two giant members. Let me repeat one thing. WTO is a member-driven organization. So the members need to talk to each other and negotiate. It provides a negotiating forum, you know, so for them to approach each other, talk to each other to try and resolve these issues. That being said, there are certain agreements that have been in place at the WTO, which if we renew or revamp, could help with some of these issues. But first we have to get our facts right. Uh, because a farmer has, uh, or uh, somebody working in a coal mine has lost their job, we really need to look at the factors behind that. You know, it's, it's sometimes lazy thinking to just blame trade. Sometimes it's technology that, are, that is the cause of that displacement. And you need governments to implement active labor market policies to solve it. Sorry, but if I may, you know, political leaders, and I've named three American presidents who are not aligned always, it's fair to say, politically, have all said, if I say the Trump administration accused the WTO of being completely inadequate, and Joe Biden, to repeat, says the US has systematic concerns. And we've also seen you talk about paying your dues. That's one indicator if a country's happy. But it's now not going to, uh, the, the Biden administration is not going to appoint new members to the panel who look at trade disputes with the WTO. What I'm trying to say is there is a narrative here where on one hand you say it's a member organisation, they've got to talk to each other. But you're receiving millions and millions of pounds and dollars to help countries do what they can't do on their own. 
So you can't you can't say it's up to countries and then still have this arbitration role. No, you, I think people don't understand the WTO. The WTO is a member organization that has a secretariat that supports members to get these negotiations done. So there's no kind of WTO sitting out there. It's the members are the WTO. Hang on, sorry. Are you saying Joe Biden doesn't understand the WTO? Because I'm taking my lead from the president of America. No, I'm saying that the way you're characterizing it, it's not the way it is. Let me tell you what people are frustrated at. If members have not been able to talk to each other with the support of the Secretariat to solve some of these problems, of course there's frustration. And it is true that the US uh, uh, um, you know, said they don't like what goes on with the dispute settlement system and that the way the, the system runs, the appellate body has overreached in terms of the way it makes judgments. That has been a complaint over many administrations. And what's the answer to that? The answer is that we should reform it, which is what we are presently discussing. One of the things we want to make sure we table at our 12th ministerial, which is now going to be on June 13, is how do we indeed reform, do the fundamental reforms of the WTO? Um, how do we work, rework the dispute settlement mechanism? so that it can serve all the members the way they want. If I may, there's presently a, a dispute in the WTO amongst the members about how to handle disputes. Yes. Right. OK. And when you say... That, when you say That is true. When you say people don't understand the WTO, do you think the WTO has to take some of the fault for that, that it's this organisation that isn't well understood around the world and people don't think it provides value for money sometimes? Well, you're right. I agree with that. And that is, I think it is the fault that people don't understand really what it is and what it does. And it's mischaracterized. Including the president of America? I'm not saying that. I don't want words put in my mouth. I think the president is not satisfied with the way the organization is working because they are not happy with the dispute settlement mechanism. And some of their complaints are well-founded. That's why we need to reform the dispute settlement system. But to reform it, it is those same members that have to sit around the table. There is no rescuer coming from outside. You've not got an easy job, have you? You really don't. The US and all the others have to sit around the table and agree on how they are going to make these reforms, be it dispute settlement, be it uh, the monitoring function. Now, all I can tell you is that as the DG, we try to support them to do that. And now we've, we are looking at the reform of the WTO's core functions as one of the big subjects that we are going to look at at the um, um, 12th ministerial. So we will start the discussion and the debate there, and then they will agree eventually on how they want to move this forward. What gets you out of bed in the morning? What motivates you? You, you could have been having... I think I have one of the most interesting jobs in the world. That's why I applied for it. Let me tell you something. This WTO, the purpose of this was inscribed in the charter when it was created in 1994, in the preamble to the Marrakesh uh, 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 Agreement. And it says that the WTO's purpose is to enhance living standards, to help create employment, and to support sustainable development. In other words, it's all about people, and that's what drives me. And the goal I have is to make everyone understand, including the members themselves sometimes when they forget, that we're here for people. You're right, the ordinary person on the street in my village in Nigeria needs to know why the WTO exists and what it exists for, because it's doing some very, very important and good things. So that's what drives me. I get up in the morning, ready, raring to go to work because I want us to deliver for people. The fisheries subsidies agreement, let me just take that. There are 260 million people that depend on fisheries in the world. If we, if we are able to conclude that deal, we will stop overcapacity and overfishing which is now almost at 50%. And that will secure the livelihoods of so many people. When we get to the response to this pandemic and we have a package agreed by all members, we have been contributing already very materially to solving the issue of vaccines, production and access, which I'm very proud about. Uh, and, uh, and that is something that delivers for people. So that's what I want everyone to know. The WTO is about people. You have been credited 
in your time in politics in Nigeria, which you've just mentioned, uh, with saving a lot of money for the country. You're in fact nicknamed the $9 billion woman for, for making sure that you could try and face down as much corruption as possible. What is it about you and your style, do you think, that you hope helps people get to a more agreement, to a better place? Well, I think it's because I never, I never give up. I'm an optimist by nature. I, I, I am very enthusiastic. I never take on a job unless I'm passionate about it. So I get up every morning wanting to go. And I think people see that. They also see that no matter how difficult the situation is, I will not give up. I will work as hard as possible to push for results. I'm very results oriented. And that's what is attractive at the WTO. We can achieve results that will benefit people. So people see that. And I think they can relate to the sincerity that I have for the job. Has being a woman helped or hindered in your political life? <laughs> I think it's helped in the sense that I'm, I'm happy to be a woman. I'm proud of being a woman. I'm proud of being who I am from where I am. So when you have that self-confidence, it helps you to lead. Uh, of course, when you're a woman, and I've written a book about it with Julia Gillard, the former prime minister of, the, of Australia, which is uh, quite popular now. It's called Women and Leadership, Real Lives, Real Lessons. And we look at eight women leaders and add ourselves you will see that when you're a woman in leadership, there are a number of challenges uh, uh, that, that confront you along the way. From looking at how you handle issues, you cannot be too soft because uh, people will then criticize you for being too soft, but you can't be too strident uh, because then they think you're overly aggressive. So women leaders, we found, are always watching their style to make sure that they balance it out. But at the end of the day, what most of uh, the women in leadership have found is that you just have to be yourself. You lead best when you're yourself because you're authentic and you don't have to try and be anyone else. So, of course, there have been challenges along the way. If you're a woman of color, there are even more challenges along the way. Uh, you know, when I walk into a room, people are surprised when they see the way I'm dressed, which is the way I've always dressed. And you can see some assumptions on the faces of some of the people, uh, you know, because they look at your appearance and make some judgments. Maybe this person cannot uh, handle the job or whatever. But the minute I open my mouth and talk about the substance, people forget that. So I don't spend time dwelling on whether I'm a woman or a woman of color. I dwell on what do I bring to the job and what is my knowledge helping to change things in the place. And that's what excites me. I think when people see you have what it takes to run, I, they, they, they relate to it. I've been a manager, for instance, for my, a long uh, time in my career at the World Bank, which is a huge organization. I've been Minister of Finance with thousands of people, you know, uh, uh, under my, in my ministry. So I, I have experience. So when I come to a job at the WTO, I try to put that experience to the benefit of the organization. And uh, what I can say is, um, you know, um, I love the job. I have to be very honest. But I also have to be honest that I do get irritated when we don't move quickly towards results. Maybe that's what the only aspect. So, uh, but I use my experience to make, try and make things work. Have you bought any furniture yet? Oh, yeah. It's too late now. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Rengozi, thank you very much indeed for your time and, and your experience. Thank you, Emma. Thank you so much for being with us. Until we meet again, stay safe and goodbye.